Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. My name is James K. Jones, and this is my story. And my name is Haley Jones, and this is his story that has now become a part of my story. So this is the season two recap. What's your favorite thing about season two? Well, I think in the beginning, when you got saved, honestly, because I feel like it was really started a whole new put you in a whole nother direction, even though you were still in prison. A whole new world. And actually, that's the thing I always <laughs> ask people. I'm like, is he saved yet? When they tell me that they're listening. Yeah. I, I'm I, like, I, oh, okay. I, and I was like, how far along are you? Like, well, I'm at, and, then, and they start trying to give me details. I'm like, is he saved yet? Because then that gives me an idea. <laughs> Where they're at on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, there's a lady. I mean, I know her, but I don't even know her. That we go to church with that was telling me all about the podcast, and she was just saying, I can hear the redemption in your voice. And I was like, How far did you get? And she said, Episode five. Her husband said, She's on five, I'm on six. And I was like, I'm not saved. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's because she knows me now. So she's right, sees, exactly. Like she knows, like, you know, she sees the way on the other side. Right, for right. Her, so that was kind of funny. And I've been surprised by people that are binge listening to this. Like we've got a certain amount of followers, and we just passed over the ten thousand download or whatever you call it. Like, yeah, the other week. Mm-hmm. That's crazy, and we're on every continent except for Antarctica. Yeah, so we've been downloading on every continent. Which I'm not even sure if they have phones on Antarctica. All that ice and freezing. I mean, who, how could <laughs> they you, do? <laughs> I'm sure. How could you have <laughs> anything working? That I'm just kidding. But uh, it, just, it I'm kind of blown away by that. Like people that just start listening to it, and then they've just listened to all of them. I even have a good friend, Robert, that he did. He did, he's not a podcast guy, but he uh, started listening to it because I was nagging him about it. Because he's always asking me questions, like go listen to the podcast, and he like got two in, and he just like binge the whole thing up to like the fifth. Uh, Season two, episode five, and he was so excited. I'm like, do you realize that's like 15 hours? <laughs> like you've listened, you've listened to 15 hours of me talking, and he's like, I just, it's good stuff. So, well, it's kind of neat. I mean, it is like kind of like a Netflix series in terms of it's just it's a story. It's it your is. story, and I mean, stories are timeless, no matter that's true. whose they are. You know that you can listen to it, and you obviously, if the story's already happened, something already happened, you want to know what happens next. That's true. That's true. So, um, but we're, I mean, this is, this is like our 23rd podcast. That's 23 hours. Like a a Netflix series usually caps at 10. (laughs) (laughs) No, they have different seasons. (laughs) Well, that's true. I I guess the seasons are 10. Okay. The seasons are 10. So what's been your favorite part of season two? Uh, I think, um, the excitement, you know, it, it, it was painful going through the the middle, you know, the episodes like when I first got to Donaldson, you know, they tried to rape me and all that stuff. That, that was hard, like reprocessing all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there was some healing in that. And I feel like I got a lot of uh, like clarity through all that. And it's just like God has always protected me and he always will. And it, you know, it just helps you like stomp out some more, just make me want to trust him more. I feel like that's even helped you in the season we're in now. Like, so the fur the couple weeks that we were actually recording those episodes, you went through like a major funk. Yeah, it was bad. Like it was, I want, I don't want to say dark, but it was kind of just like sad a little bit. Like what well, put me back in a dark place. Yeah. I, I remember like there was a lot of shock and a lot of, uh, you're just going through stuff like that, and you know, you kind of bar- I buried all that, like it's you know, because I knew that something good came out of it, so I was like, okay, I was supposed to be here, but at the same time, like if you put yourself back in that situation, that was a desperate situation. But coming through those two weeks, when like like I said, even we were recording, and you were just retelling the story, and you went through this dark, weird. It's almost like you were going through the process again, which the good part yeah. of that. I feel like on the other side of it, like now, I mean, just I live with you. So I see your demeanor (laughs) most of the time. And we work together. So we're together a lot. But your overall demeanor just it seems to be more, I don't know, like even uh, even more hopeful, like even for the season that we're in now. Yeah, it's it's helping me realize like seasons and the process. Like Mm -hmm. if you're following Jesus, he's always got you in the middle of a process. And even if it doesn't look like. You understand, you know, that makes sense. Like on the other side, 
it, it makes sense. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. Now, you know, now it all makes sense. Like, looking back, it all all makes sense. But, like, when you're in the middle of it, it you're just, like, scared and fearful and all the things. Yeah, it's hard to zoom out yeah, when you're, like, you in can't. the midst of chaos. And or This season has helped me with that because it's, like, you know, we're in the middle of something new now with our company and even this podcast and all this stuff, like, I don't know what I'm doing with it. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, you don't know what you're doing with this podcast stuff or, you know, I mean, I know how to cook, you know how to coach, you know, we're good at that stuff. But, uh, it, it is, that's just, it's been very helpful in helping me just like, it's kind of like just reignited, you know, I just, what's next, you know, cause there's always something next. We, right. There's always something next. So it's And that's exciting. true for everybody just yeah. as an encouragement. Like, Absolutely. I feel like I need to encourage myself in that. <laughs> So I'm sure someone else needs to hear that too. But okay, so what's some of the questions or a question that you got? You want to start there? Or? There was one that I cannot answer, and I don't know. I don't even know where else else to look. But I said I would find the name of the the prison commissioner that institute the honor dorm in all the places in Alabama. Uh-huh. I can't find his name. Hmm. I, I know that he was appointed by Don Siegelman, who was elected in 1999. And he served from 99 to 2003 because then uh, Don Siegelman was defeated by uh, Bob Riley. So he didn't get another <clears throat> another chance at being governor. So that prison commissioner only got to be commissioner for four years, I believe. So maybe this is someone, if somebody out there knows, I mean, that's listening. Yeah, I don't think so. It's what, what, what is the actual question? They want to know the name of the prison commissioner that appointed the honor dorm to all the things in 1999. Okay. And I can't find his name. Okay. But I know the governor was Don Siegelman. Yeah. And he was appointed by him and he was a new prison commissioner. So mm. but let's don't let's don't get stuck on yeah, that. Yeah. That's a technical Okay. Any other question? I mean I know we had more questions. What's another one? I got a bunch of questions. Yeah. Uh where do we start? This so j- from- just to be clear, this is questions that we got from people throughout the season and after as people were listening that we are answering now. Okay. Yeah, and from our pa- we put it out to our patrons too. Right, exactly. Um, and that's our – tell them what our patrons are. So, yeah, before we get to the question, we are – we have – okay, patrons are basically people that listen to our podcast. And, and support the show. And support – you know, us recording it. I We did some research when we started spending so much time recording. And money. And money <laughs> <laughs> recording. But, um, you know, we live in a world of free content. You know, blogs and podcasts are usually, you know, they're all free. But we, I found this way that a lot of creators is what they call them, mm-hmm. a way for creators to kind of support their creations in our cast, yeah. in our um, case it's a podcast but it's just where you support us i mean you can either do three dollars a month five dollars a month or ten so it's not a lot but it's just a way to just support us to keep going and to keep telling telling the story and bringing bringing that to you so and what, but with that we've added okay extra so value. with that so it's not just like you give the three dollars but we've actually created more another podcast called the for real real which I, maybe you've heard us talk about but that's where we talk about we say things that we will not or most people would not put on their highlight reel so just things that are going on in our life like present time real life like with our relationship, our marriage with our kids, with our church, our finances. health, our weight, food, church, all the things, cancel culture. But that that we'll is talk about all that. That's on the the Patreon is subscription only, right? So you get to listen to that when you become a patron. So we call it like a friend of the show, a best friend, or basically family. Yeah. So, so when you when you subscribe to that, there's an app you get. It's a Patreon app, or you you can download the app. Yeah, you download it. Yes, you don't need the app. <laughs> no, the app is just going to magically come through the air and drop into your No, phone. I'm telling you, when people tell me these things, I need them to spell it out for me. Okay. How to do it. <laughs> well, but you can listen. You can do it through a computer or you can go to their website. But if you download the app, it gives you like a social media type feed. So like on the Patreon app, like there's like a Team Jones feed. So you can just click, listen to all the pod, extra pod. There's extra content too from... Straight out of prison podcast, and then we're you know we're doing a bunch of neat stuff with like that. pictures and yeah, but it's easy to access all of that through the app. Yeah, and you can do that through our website. I mean, you can find it anywhere social media, but it's our Patreon account. You can see it on the podcast link. TimJones dot co slash podcast. Yeah. You know. All right. So some, but a lot of these questions come from our patrons because we directly communicate with them. Right. 
And that's another way not to have to have those annoying ads on here. You know, I don't have to stop and say, let's pause and go to Hello Tushy. <laughs> James is against having ads. I'm not so much, but it is a way for us to kind of I'm not, support, you know, ourselves. I'm not against having that. ads as long as it's not something that's just like fake. Like, I'm not going to buy something to connect to my toilet seat to squirt water up my butt. See, I might. <laughs> you would not. <laughs> I might, you honestly. Not. You might buy it, but you wouldn't use it. <laughs> you, you wouldn't use it. It'd be something, there's something else in the way. But uh, anyways, let's move on with that. One of the questions, um, have I said any questions yet? <laughs> no, we haven't. All right, one comes from Nora. She says she's fascinated with the way that I tell Bible stories. <laughs> Yeah, she wanted to know. She's like, can you just do a podcast that where James tells Bible stories like in his own words? Like she was referencing. <laughs> was she was she referencing where you talked about David, the Joseph, or the Joseph, and how somebody wanted that good Hebrew stuff? I mean, that's what <laughs> happened. I mean, if you read if you read that story, the lady was coming at him. She was an older lady. She was when a you say man. she was coming at him, she was coming on to him is what he means. She, she was coming on to him. She was coming at him, and she would not let up. And she was just going, she wanted some of that good Hebrew stuff. <laughs> she just had to have it. And he didn't give it to her, so good kudos for him. But uh, I'm, I'm down with that. I mean, maybe we could do, I would love to do that. I'd love telling like, I love telling my kids the Bible stories in my words because I feel like they get it. Well, I've actually told you for several years now, like when we've been talking and I'm like, oh, what was that story? And I ask you the story and you tell me what the story is. And I'm like, you tell that story like nobody else. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you might even interject a couple cuss words. <laughs> Hey, well, you do. I mean, you, not that you have to, but it's just very funny how you tell the story because it is the real story, but in your own words and kind of helps with, you know, understanding it in context of today Yeah, and making it relevant. I, I agree. So, so maybe who knows where we're going with this. I know I'm, I want to do a companion podcast to the Straight Outta Prison podcast where we kind of dig deeper on like how I learned things and you know, one of the last episodes, I think it was episode 11 of season two about falling apart and dealing with issues. You know, that was one of our patrons, Jonathan. He, I got a message from him. He said, he, I, I really enjoyed every episode. I love the podcast, but something about that one really touched me. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, telling stories like that, you help people, you know, deal with their own, you know, want to. Like, oh, wait, I can be free, too. Because right. this is not, like, there ain't nothing special about James K. Jones. There's something special about human beings because we're all created in the image of God. So there's nothing. I mean, I remember my uh, my dad's wife, she used to annoy me when I first started my my Jesus journey. She would tell me, I believe in all that, but not everybody gets it like you. And so I'm like, but. Everybody gets can. it like you yeah like i had some kind of special like thing with jesus and i was like maybe not but everybody can i mean he's you know he don't he's no respecter of persons that's the scripture like he, mm -hmm. he wants us all he wants all of us the same yeah he's, i mean he's got a plan for all of us like our plans are not gonna look the same but i disagree that uh you don't have, there's no special end to get God's best, you just have to surrender to him and let, listen to him. You know, like mm -hmm. at the, the miracle that Jesus did where he turned water into wine, his mom looked at the servants and was like, just whatever he says, to do it. And they were like, okay, what do we do? He's like, we'll dip it in, dip it out. Okay, it's wine. Woo. Like, <laughs> it's, but it's that simple. <laughs> follow, yeah, it's that simple. Yeah. Following Jesus is that simple. You just, whatever he says to you, do it. It's simple, but it's hard. Oh, it can be so hard, but yeah. it can also be so simple. That was one of the things <laughs> for me before, like before I had like a heart change. I won't even say heart change until I came like alive spiritually. I thought that like religion or doing the right thing was just like this hard, like labor thing that you had to do. But I realized like you don't do it by yourself. He helps you. Like he, he ain't going to help you do something he don't want you to do. Right. But like if it's part of the plan for you that he has for you, then he, he's got the grace to help you. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my, the first death that I experienced close to me was my Mima in 2003. And I dreaded her, you know, just dreaded because I didn't have a lot of death when I was growing up. 
And it was just amazing, just like the grace and the peace that I got. And it was like, oh, I can even get through this and be okay. You know, so but let's move on from that. Yeah. I mean, I have more to say, but we can talk about it later. Let's get to another question. Okay. Um, this question has come across the board. Is Alabama, like, am I exaggerating about the violence and the way the Alabama Department of Correction is ran? Like, is it really that bad? And the answer to that is yes. But since I was there, I left there in 1999, it's worse now than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. Because they keep they keep packing them in. Um, it's, just, it's, it's bad. Didn't recently, I remember we talked about this like a few weeks ago or a month ago or something, a YouTube video got leaked from prison. Oh, there's a lot the of... Prison. See, that's something we didn't... When I was in prison, I don't even think we knew what cell phones were. Because... I don't know if we disagree over when they came out. I know when I got locked up in 1993, my aunt Denise, her, her husband Kenny, he's a, like a, a businessman, entrepreneur. He's got all the money. <laughs> and he bought her a car that had like one of those big cases in yes, the Yes, my dad got one of those. In the car. And I that was the that. only thing that I, I'd never seen anything like that. But then when I got out of prison in 1999, everybody's running around with these little phones. Right. And they're in the grocery store. Honey. What kind of tomatoes? Like I'm like these people are crazy. Like, that is crazy to think that like from the time you went in. I didn't you know. That. I never saw and the computers, internet, all that stuff. You know, like we would see it would. I remember uh, they would do uh, Yahoo commercials or AOL America Online, mm-hmm. and we were like, what does that mean? And then we would read the news, and it would say, if you invested in Yahoo stock, you're a millionaire. And then we'd be like, what it. What it, we don't even know what it is. Like we didn't know what it was. Yeah, we didn't understand the concept of like cell phones and internet stuff like that. So there was none of that. But I think I volunteered in Alabama prisons from like 2000 to I think like 2013, 12. I think 2012 was when I. I mean, I still go and do like special stuff. Yeah, but I don't. I don't go like regular. They all got cell phones now. And I had guys that I was working with when I was doing prison ministry that would want to call me. And I'd be like, are you crazy? Don't, don't be getting me. I'm, mm-mm. But now they got smartphones. Now they got iPhones. But they're really not supposed to have them in there, but they have them anyway. No. Okay, but let's go back to the question was, is so, it really that violent? And you said yes, even more so. It's more than it was when I was there. But now these guys are having these smartphones, and they just mash record and do a video like we would. And then they send it to YouTube. So that video that came out, basically, what was it? It was a uh, a guy that's uh, like an activist kind of guy. Like he's trying to tell the world what's happening there. Mm-hmm. We don't. I don't know what happened to him. Oh. But, but the video is. But it was a beating or something. In the video, it showed them dragging him out mm-hmm. in a trail of blood, and then the guy Ugh. that was doing the video went in his cell, and it was just full of blood. And it was, I believe, it was by the. It wasn't by their inmates, it was by the police. But let's not get stuck on that. Right, but I was just making the point that it, it, it was that bad, and it is still, if not worse. No, it's worse. It, yeah. it's def- I, that's why I stopped going in there. The mm-hmm. last time we went, uh, Gilbert and I went to Donaldson to try to do a life after prison class. And when we toured through there, it's like whatever change that happened there when I was there, it's, it's not like that anymore, and now it's even worse. And I was just like... I ain't doing this to myself. Like, yeah. you know, if y'all can get it under control, get it, you know, where it needs to be, I'll do that. Now, I do go in some of the other prisons with our church. You know, when we have freedom conferences and stuff like that, mm-hmm. I've done St. Clair, I've done Bibb. Um, but it's crazy. Yeah. And they, they just keep packing them in there. You know, I was at the, the Bibb uh, correctional facility with a f- friend of mine doing classes. Gil, somebody that I met when I was in prison. I did 12 weeks for him and his little program that he's got down there. And there was a guy that was a prison fellowship guy and, you know, sincere, but just don't know what he's talking about. And he's like, I just don't understand the violence. (laughs) And I'm like, would you look at what you're looking at? This is this room here is designed for probably 50 people. There are 200 people packed in here. What do you think is going to happen? Right. What can, what can happen? It's just, it's a recipe for disaster. But now, now they have cell phones and they have heroin. So, and the heroin is just coming in, coming in, coming in, these guys, and now people are just dying. So my question is, I know you say, who bring, how do they get the heroin in? Well, they've always said that drugs come into prison through visitation. And 
the interesting thing about this past year and the COVID is that it's been on lockdown. There's been no volunteers, like churches. Nobody can go in prison except the police. And there's been no visitation. And uh, heroin overdoses are worse now than they've ever been. What? So who's bringing it in? Who do you think? The police officers? Who? Duh. I mean, that's always wow. been the case. I mean, I'm not saying some of that stuff didn't come in like that. But it's just, it's a corrupt. Right. Gosh. And Al- I mean, you know, I'm from Alabama. I love Alabama. This is my this is my home. But they don't do prison well. They do not do prison well. They're nothing, you know. And I was in prison in Florida, and it was hard, and it was prison, and it was, you know, they were trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate us. They didn't run their prisons like that. They ran it like the military. Like mm. their their officers were like like the military. But um, Alabama's under investigation. And then uh, Governor Ivey just signed a bill to build four new prisons and just basically knock down all the other ones. And you got people out there protesting that. So... You know, I know people mean well, and these young people don't know what they're talking about, but I don't comment on people's, like, social media stuff because I don't yeah. want to get involved. But they were doing that where they were protesting that because it was something out of private prisons. And I was like, I don't even know what you're saying. Like, we would have given anything to have a private prison because when it's a private prison, it's ran by – it's ran different. So it's just a mess. It needs to be totally – the whole thing needs to be overhauled. Yeah. And I hope they do, but it's it's pretty bad. It's sad, yeah. And people are dying every day. And if you want more information about that, there's a there's a lady that used to work for Fox Six when I was doing cooking cooking spots there. Yeah. Her name's Beth Shelburne. She has a Facebook page. She's an investigative journalist, and she has really dug deep. And she was she's just not letting it go. Like she's mm-hmm. every day pushing, pushing, pushing. And um, she's doing good work. And I really appreciate what she's doing to to shine a light on that because. You know, you get back to that thing, well, you're supposed to be in prison. You are, but is it supposed to be like that? Right. Are you supposed to have to deal with that? Uh, another question is, how is the honor dorm now? Mm-hmm. Um, so I tried to do the math on that. That would have been 20, we'd be 22 years in now. From, wow. From what I understand, there is still honor dorm at every uh, facility in the state of Alabama. But from what I saw from most of them, even the one at Donaldson, is it's not the same because they're not hold, they don't have the standards that they had, so like some of them try to, but it takes a mix of the inmates that are already on the inside, like they have to be bought into it, and then the administration and the chapel, like you have to have, you know, you have to have the inmates, you have to have the administration and the police, and you have to have like free will volunteers that want to see that. Um, and so, if one of those kind of goes yeah. missing or is not good then it kind of breaks down i can see that and it becomes like symbolic like kind of like religious denominations you know like one time god was doing all this stuff and so we're doing all this and then now we're still doing the same thing but it just ain't the same yeah yeah <laughs> so it's kind of like that i mean i have a dream like i have a dream i do i would love to like figure out a way to like redo the honor dorm or you know what about redo the whole prison system uh, that's for James K. Jones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's for the elected. Go big or go home, baby. That's for the that's for the elected officials to deal with. <laughs> that's, that's their problem. I mean, no, I would love to help, but I mean, ain't nobody asking me for help. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I would. Like, well, we said. I mean, me and Coverhouse said that when we were like in the middle of the thick of when we were gaining momentum and everything was changing. Then the, the guy came in and said, "We want one of these everywhere." Coverhouse was like. I bet if we keep going, they give us a whole prison. Like, if we could keep running it like this. And I was like, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, you just have, you know, you have a prison where people want to do something different. You can go here. Right. Um, And then actually produce, like, good stuff. Instead of just reform PTSD and more pain and more. But it's sad. The people, you know, a lot of people are dying now. Okay, so which brings me to my next question. You just brought up Culverhouse, Jason Culverhouse, your mm-hmm. uh, roommate, cellmate, <laughs> for a couple of years who helped start the Honor Dorm or was one of the key players with you. Um, and you mentioned briefly in a couple of the episodes part of his story. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I have had personally loads of people I have to ha- give me ha- ask me questions about him. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to say a whole lot about him. He has given me permission to write because I started a book, and I, I mean, I'm still in contact with him. Mm-hmm. 
I, I called him and wrote him. I was like, look, I'm working on a book, but like your story bumped into my story and I really want to tell it, but I want your permission. And so I wrote it. How I wanted to write it. And then um, I sent it to him and he said, I just one thing <laughs> I'd said that he, he killed his younger brother. He's like, it was actually my older brother. I was the baby of the family. And I was like, oh, my bad. You know, let's remind people. Can you remind people a little bit of a story? The what, what you breezed over for people that are like, oh, I missed that. It was a uh, it was a famous uh, case in Alabama, and there was actually a movie made out of it out of, about it, the Culver House Murders. It was down in Arrington, Alabama, down below Dale County, I believe, down below Dothan, mm-hmm. out rural area. Whole family got slaughtered, and um, it was an unsolved murder thing, and. Um, Jason was at his girlfriend's house and had, you know, had a pretty tight alibi, you know. Jason was a son of the family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he had an older brother who had been written out of the wheel by his dad, so he became the, the top suspect. But then they proved that he didn't do it. Then they, they couldn't figure out a motive for Jason. And anyways, it was an unsolved murder mystery for, I think, three or four years. And it was around the time of... The uh, psychological profiling of criminals and forensics, like oh, psychological started, yeah. forensics, where they couldn't, uh, they wrote it off as a cold case and actually had floated an idea that maybe this guy was into drugs because he owned a trucking company mm-hmm. and he was like slaughtered by a Mexican cartel or something, you know. The, the, the dad owned the truck yeah. company. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're a very prominent family. I mean, they were. I mean, Isn't there a school named after a building or his, something? I can't. I don't, if it's grandfather, great grandfather, it's in his, you know. In the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Culver House School of Law at the University of Alabama. Okay. Was his family. That family. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's still there. Mm-hmm. But uh, they sent the, the cold case to the University of Colorado, some college students that were studying this criminal psychology stuff, and they cracked the case. And I don't want to say how they cracked the case. But they, because uh, I want to tell the story later. Yeah. But they went to his older brother and said, your your baby brother slaughtered your family. And he was like, no, he didn't. His baby brother is Jason Culverhouse. Yeah. So it was your and his son. brother was like, no, no, he didn't. And uh, they said, no, he we'll, we'll show you. So they prepped him and gave him some questions to ask to, like, break him down. And he did and confessed to it. And then he uh, quickly made a plea deal because he didn't want to get the electric chair, that if he would confess, and that by that time he was married and had a baby, that if he would uh, make a confession and you know do all the stuff, that they wouldn't give him the death penalty and that they wouldn't bother his wife and kid. So uh, he ended up with a life without parole sentence, so he'll die in prison. And then he went to prison and turned into, like, you know, a gangster, because, you know, he... Was going to be there the rest of his well, life. Well, any person that's killed their mom, their dad, and their brother. Oh God! There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Well, see, I didn't know him then. I didn't. I only knew him after he had an experience with Jesus. He went on a Kairos weekend, had an experience with Jesus, and then just his life flipped. And that was when I met him. And but I was, he was my cell partner the last year and a half that I was in prison. Okay, year and a half. Yeah. And he became like a brother to me. He's somebody, like an older brother to me, somebody I love to this day. I mean, it's hard for someone like me to imagine being that close. I mean, even just like physically living with someone in the same cell that I knew committed that kind of crime, like murdering the people closest, his mom and dad and brother. Oh, it was worse than that. He had, when he got to prison, he got a back tattoo. You know what a back tattoo is? A tattoo on your back? Well, a back tattoo (laughs) is where it covers your whole back. Okay. So it's like a huge painting. So he had a tattoo put on his back with three, it's like three tombstones. It says, mom, dad, bro. And then a picture of the devil, like holding a pitchfork. Oh, my gosh. And then on the bottom, it says the devil made me do it. And that's permanently on his back? Yeah. I mean, that you saw, uh, 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 that's crazy. That's insane. But I don't want to get too deep into his story because, like I said, he gave me permission to tell parts of his story. Mm -hmm. We're either going to make it a couple episodes after we get done with our story or maybe even do our own podcast. Because people are still interested in that story. And I know a part of the story that's never been told because it's from his side. There was a movie made. It was a USA movie called The Morrison Murders. You can still find it. What is it called? 
it was called the Morrison murders. The Morrison murders. You know how they okay. rename stuff? Yeah, yeah. And I watched it when I got out of prison. And and it's that story. It's his story. It is, but it's not totally accurate. Okay. But when I watched that story, I didn't speak to him for almost a year because I was just like, hold, like, hold up. And you were out of prison at this time. Yeah, and he was one of my best friends. You were just like. Kind of, I wasn't shocked. Yeah. I mean, I knew this. He told me everything. He didn't tell me all at one time, but I would get curious, mm-hmm. you know, ask, you know, well, yeah, questions. if you're sleeping above or below whatever you were. Well, the weird thing was after person. he had an like his family disowned him when he came to prison. I mean, he killed their, you know, yeah, duh. Um, but he started after he had an experience with Jesus, he started like reconnecting to parts of his family. He tried to reconcile with his older brother, and his older brother took a call from him, like one call, and said, that's good, and I love you, and I'll always love you, but you took my mama from me, so I can't, I just can't, I just, and I, I get that, you know? Mm-hmm. His brother actually went, was, I read an article recently where his brother was like, please don't kill my brother, to the because the judge that sentenced him was a family friend of his dad's like, you know, my mom's dad, my mom's dad, my, my, my dad's dad, my, please don't kill my brother. And so just seeing their pain, like that side of it, it's a lot, it's a lot, but it is a story of amazing grace and redemption. And what happened with Jason was real and is real. And it, it, it's just amazing grace, and that's all. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. But he reconciled with his mom's sister, his aunt, and this was her sister that he killed. It'd be like somebody killing Abby, hmm. and then she forgave him and started coming to see him and doing all this stuff. So she started sending him Bible studies written in his mom's handwriting, where she used to have a women's. She did a women's group couple times a week but she led them holy cow and she would write out the outlines and she used them for her bible studies but she saved them well now her sister had all the every week as a new believer she was sending him those bible studies written by his mother Ooh. that he killed i mean it's crazy but one night i will wreck you well i um i didn't ask a lot of questions because it's like you know you find out some parts of it and then you know but there was one night I just said, I was asking him questions, and it was, uh, just how can you do that? So I came, I found out, like, he ki- he killed his brother in his sleep, shot him in his sleep, so he didn't know it hit him. But his dad heard the gun go off, ran down the hall. He hid in the hall and shot his dad in the back and killed his dad. So his brother or his dad didn't know that it was him. And then he went in to where his mom was and the door was locked and he took a shotgun and blew the doorknob off and went in and when he shot in shot at her but it didn't kill her and she was trying to make a phone call like she was trying to call the police but he he was smart though like he can't like he's just smart like he he came up with this thing like if you use a gun in your house they can't take your fingerprints off of it because it's already your gun. Right. So he used his own gun and then put it back. And then um, when he came in the house, he he took the phone off the hook so that no calls could go out. And then, but he had to go, and then he killed her. And I was like, how could, like, she gave you, like, your, like your mom, you know, how? Real quick, so he shot her and he it didn't kill her, and then she tried to make a call. She had the phone in her hand. Um, but I said, well, did she know that it was you? Did she? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what was she doing? Like, what was she saying? And he said, and this is the part that always gets me, especially now I'm a daddy. He said she was praying for me. I'm praying that God would would somehow save me. And he did. <laughs> Eventually oh, he did. But it's, it's, cra- it's, it's a crazy story. It's a, but, I mean, I feel like that could be a whole... That could be a podcast. <laughs> I mean, you got we got the oh, S Town. Yeah, thing. It's only seven episodes. I could get ten episodes out of this because he told he's over time. He's told me. He told me, and the story that you hear, like the, because he don't ever talk. He don't talk in court. <laughs> he. I mean, he's never like got his story out there. But there's he has a side to it, and it's awful and it's evil. But um, 
I think his story needs to be told. But the redemptive side, which was after you met him, is yeah. also kind of just, I mean, the whole thing is kind of it's mind-blowing. It's amazing. Yeah. But if you Google that, the Culver House Murders, <sighs> like you can read all, and people are always asking, where's he at? And, you know, I mean, I'll ever comment. It's not my, uh, they can keep trying to figure that out. But that let's just say there's more to that story. Mm-hmm. It, you don't just kill your family for nothing. Yeah. So, uh, ooh, that's heavy. Let's move on from that. <laughs> <coughs> Let's take a move. Uh, another question. Uh, Wayne asked me, he said, have you thought about having a reunion where you take the original 12 guys back in and do like a thing with the guys that are in the honor dorm now? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like an amazing idea. But the only problem with that is like one of those original 12 was cover house. He'll never get out of prison. So he's already there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Huey Coon. I think there was some kind of robbery gone wrong when he was a young, young man. Um, somebody ended up shot or something, and he's got a life without parole. He'll never get out of prison. Chris, I have no idea where Chris is. Terry Bush, he was one of those guys. He actually lives in Calera, I believe. Mm-hmm. Hopefully he's listening to this off- podcast. Hey, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and me and um, the other guys, I don't even know where they are. It's crazy though, like kind of you make the assumption when you're hearing this, and I do too, like, oh, you did your prison sentence and now you're out. Whereas the reality of it is that this was a, a lot of them had life without parole. Yeah. But also the recidivism recidiv oh, how do you say that? Recidivism. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like we've talked about before of that it's more common. I don't can't remember the exact stat. It is now when you get out you come back within a year or something. None of the guys that have got out have went back. The, From the honor dorm? No. no oh, okay. Now, of the of the 12. Okay. Now, there was a guy, when we started the honor dorm, his name was Mike Brown, and he was just a big, silly, goofy, would never take anything serious. We threatened to kick him out, so he would always do just enough to stay in. And okay. I remember, like, he just wouldn't, he wasn't going to do anything different. He was young and stupid. He was about six feet tall, big white guy. <sighs> He was annoying, but uh, somebody was teaching a class where he talked about the guy was talking about my daughters have a curfew, and he started laughing. And he was like, "What's what are you laughing at?" And Mike Brown was like, "Curfew! I ain't never had no curfew." <laughs> and the guy that was teaching the class was like, "Well, it's funny you got one now because when they lock down at ten thirty, that's your curfew. You got a curfew now." And Mike Brown just like shut up, but he would never take anything that we were doing serious, and he got out. Like maybe the beginning of ninety nine. And I got invited in two thousand and five to go into Donaldson and hand out Christmas bags. And I've always usually declined the offer because they want you to go in at like four o'clock in the morning. Because mm-hmm. you go around, everybody's asleep. You just give a bag. You know, everybody gets the same thing. You say, Merry Christmas, Jesus loves you. And they had needed people to go on death row and nobody wanted to go on death row. And I'd never been to death row. So I was like, I'll go. And me and Jeremy, that used to work for me, uh-huh. we went to death row. And the first cell that I went up to and I put it in and I said, Merry Christmas, Jesus loves you. I called his voice. He said, thank you. And I called his voice. And I went back and I was like, Mike Brown, is that you? And he was like, James Jones. Ah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And then I just, I started crying. Like, what are you doing on death row? Oh, you know, man, I got out. I got framed. I got a case. They framed me on a case. And I'm like, you don't get to death row for getting, I mean, you have to have like a capital crime to get a death sentence, bro. Like, but so that uh-huh. that's it. I mean, I don't know where he is now. I need to look him up. Then there was another guy um, that we had in the honor dorm. His name was Kenny. I won't say his last name because lo- this was local. He was one of those guys that was always like a, a hard you know, like a well, it's hard right guy. We got to do everything just right, kind of guy. He got out of prison in two thousand seven, I believe. He went through the reentry program at the foundry. Uh huh. Saw him one time, but he was just real haughty, real. You know, I got Jesus and me and Jesus, we got our thing. And I was like, well, good luck with that. I mean, I'm, I mean, I don't do all that. I mean, I got Jesus and we got our thing, but it ain't all that like pride, like. Six months later, Steve, this was when I had Cairo. Steve came in Cairo's and he said, have you watched the news today? And I said, no, I've been at work. And he said, um, Kenny said his last name, killed his grandmother. 
today, beat her to death because oh he was strung out on he was strung out on crack or meth or something. What? And I just like just that. Just, I started crying. Steve, he was like, "Don't cry." I was like, "I don't know. I'm not trying to cry. I mean, I gotta go. I'm working, but I mean." <laughs> I don't like how do you get I oh, mean how horrible. do you get there but and it's that's like, one of the guys that helped start the honor dorm he didn't help start but he was um, in it he was in it okay yeah gosh that's so, so sad yeah but then there were several other guys good great stories coming out of there like a guy named Arthur uh, Marvin people that had like life without parole sentences Mr. Johnny uh, people that got out and are doing great and mm. you know I've kind of lost touch with a lot of them I think um, I'd love to see Chris but he's like out west somewhere doing something i don't know what he's up to now but he got mad at me one time because i confronted him some of his behaviors because he he like takes his kids around from state to state i'm like you know it's not it's not good to do that with kids and he got upset with me but i mean i still love him i got one from a uh one of our people named jessica she's curious about why i never talked about visits at donaldson like visits from family yeah because she said i talked about a lot when i was in prison florida but she noted that when I was in, when I was at Donaldson, I didn't talk about my granny or my mom or any visits. Mm-hmm. I got one visit at Donaldson from my mom, and they treat them like criminals. Like they like take their pants off. They do all kind of nasty what? stuff. What they made her take strip, their pants off? They made her like strip down or something. And so I ne- I t- I was like well just write letters and talk on the phone. I'm not putting y'all, uh, especially my grandma. Like no. Mm-mm. So Ugh. I only had one visit that. Uh, two, six, seven, three years I was there. Wow. I didn't want to visit. I was like, I don't, I'm not, this bad, this bad enough as it is, I'm not putting my family through that. So, yeah. so that's why that. Uh, we got a message from Elizabeth. She is a probation officer. And she says she came across the podcast. She started listening to it. She listens to it every week. And it is her weekly encouragement to keep doing what she's doing. Because by listening to it, she sees that change is possible. And she really, probation officers really have a thankless job. I mean, Mm -hmm. I salute them, you know, the good ones, the bad ones. I don't salute (laughs) y'all. Y'all need to go do something else. (laughs) Go work at Walmart. Uh, Amazon's hiring. Uh, But that she uh, is encouraging to her because it's like it makes her want to work with her people. Like, you know, you can do something different. Then I got one of the most touching messages I got. I just got this message today. Uh, her name is Vanessa. She's from Indiana. She had a son that was sentenced when he was 19 to a maximum security prison in Indiana. He had a heroin addiction, and he died. In a, he OD'd in a cell by himself at 25, and um, she's you know been wrecked behind that. But she said she was trying to find ways to understand, and you know, and she came across the podcast. She's been listening to it. She found it. She says it's helping her to heal, and um, that she can hear her son's voice through my voice. Like it's helping her to understand and to heal. Well, that's neat. and I know, but I just like I hate. I I want to. I say thank you for that, but I mean, I'm so sad. I'm sorry about your son. I mean, because that could easily be me. Right. And that honestly, these days, that's the story of a lot of people. And I got a lot of questions about the Kairos ministry, the Kairos weekend, like the thing they do in prison, uh, asking me if I, I've been a part of that. The thing with the Kairos weekend, it's a three-day weekend. Mm-hmm. They prepare for that for six months, sometimes eight months. <laughs> and you go to two or three meetings a week, and you go off as a group for the weekend. And I've just never been able to put the time together to do it. And honestly, I've never wanted to do that. Like, it just seems like it's too much for me. It's good for them. But so I've never done a Cairo's weekend where I was there the whole time. But they have a thing called um, Fourth Day Speaker. They always bring somebody in at the last that's been through a Cairo's that just kind of tells their journey. And I've uh, I've been a Fourth Day Speaker for a Cairo's dozens of times. And I, lo- I love doing that because I get to see the guys in, on the other side. Brandy who is one of our top fans. Yes. <laughs> we love Brandy. She she encourages us so much. Oh, yes. She's great. And I feel like there's something about her and I, maybe our backgrounds, I don't know this. I just feel it. Like maybe we're similar in some way. Like maybe mm-hmm. like family. I don't know that. Um, but I just feel a connection with her. Yeah. But she's been trying to get her brother 
to listen to the podcast because his story is kind of similar to mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, he finally started listening. I got a message from him, Kevin. He says, I found the podcast through my sister because she kept on about it. He said, I've, I've been just listening to the whole thing. <laughs> and he said he could see similarities to, from his own story, like how it started through prison. He said, I didn't actually come to faith in prison. It was my story was a little different. But he has since then. Um, like on the other side, mm-hmm. but he uh, said the the one I think it was episode the end of season two, episode one. You know where I had an experience with Jesus. You know that that really touched him. You've covered a lot of questions right in a row there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm reading them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I put I, I I just pasted them all into a notepad so mm-hmm. I could have them. Do you have any? I'm sorry. Uh, gosh, I think you've covered a lot of the ones. There was a lot about Culver House, and I did get some about the visitors. And I've gotten also a lot of questions about what's next, and is there going to be actually a season three? I've had people stop me and say, please don't stop. (laughs) So, but I have to say, the name, and I always say this, the name of the podcast is Straight Out of Prison. So, of course, we're going to say what happened when you got straight out of prison. (laughs) I mean, because that is a story. I mean, I this I guess a little teaser. And don't worry, I won't say too much. But the fact that like you came to Birmingham when you got out of prison with literally a paper sack with everything you owned. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and to look at your life today and mm. really all that's happened in between then that you got out of prison, came to a new city with I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about, the old time grocery bags that are Paper brown grocery paper bag. the brown paper bags. Brown paper bag. That's what I'm talking about. One of those is what you had, and that's everything you owned that's everything coming into Birmingham. So you know there's a story there of <laughs> from that to this. That was a, that's that's exciting, that part. Yeah. I mean, the first actually the first uh first about eight months out of prison. It was just like a uh it's crazy. Don't give it away. I won't talk about it's it. It's free at last, free at last. Thank God <laughs> Almighty. I'm free at last. But it, no, but I mean, but God kept his word to me. Like, you'll be my man in Birmingham. I got a plan. Just trust me. Mm-hmm. Just trust me. And it was, uh, you know, it's hard coming out. And, you know, I want to get married. I want to get, you know, I need to buy a house. I need to start a business. All the things I had in my mind. Little did you know you had quite a while to wait for that. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> 13 years. 13 That's insane. Years. And a lot of pain, a lot of painful relationships in between. <laughs> but let's don't let's don't give all yeah. that away. So yes, there there will be a there re, there really will be a season three. I promise we're not going to stop. Also, if you're sharing this with people, I did note this when uh, we were having a, that group we had a couple weeks ago, where the guy was saying, "I can't find this podcast on my phone." And he was typing in straight out of prison. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, we did it after, like, out of the straight out of Compton thing. We did straight out of prison, O-U-T-T-A. Yeah. So if you're sharing it with somebody and they're trying to type it in, I mean, if you send the link, they got it. But they have to type in to find it straight, O-U-T-T-A prison. Out of. Straight out of prison. Out of prison. Straight out of prison. Yeah. And then there is one more. I want to thank um, and just recognize Dalton Moore. Yes. He's our, He's our sound editor. He has been amazing. And content. So the coughs and the ums and the, does that make sense when there's a dozen yeah. in one minute? And he did all the music. He did the artwork. He did, I mean, yes. this has been, and this is his first podcast. And I honestly, I don't even know how we found him. Like it was your, you, you said, I can't get this guy's name off my mind. <laughs> and I was like, true. does he do podcasts? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you can ask him and see, but he's been such a gift to us and um, just, Appreciate him so much. If you ever want to know thing about Dalton, look up Cornerstone Ranch in, yeah. Al- in Alabama. He's the uh, director. You know, it's, tell us a little bit about Cornerstone Well, Ranch. he has a lot of things going on. He's yeah. very gifted, and um, he is the director of Cornerstone Ranch, and that is a, a kids' camp site here in Gardendale. I believe it's in Gardendale. It, or if it's not, it's right outside of Gardendale. And, and they do camps and work with kids, and really their mission is to serve kids and 
bring him Jesus through outdoor activities and Mm -hmm. all that. So Cornerstone Ranch, um, he's a director of that. He does an awesome job. There's a camp in the summer. Yes, it's amazing. That fill up fast, so they're probably already filled up by the time you hear this. (laughs) Imagine if there was something like that when I was a kid instead of going to the Free Will Baptist camp. Yeah. Like maybe I would not be recording this particular podcast. (laughs) We are like throwing the Free Will Baptist under the bus. If you are Um, Free Will Baptist. No, I can. Because I There's no one. judgment. <laughs> no, but that's like people that, like, you can talk, I can talk about my mom, that's my mom, but you better not talk about my mom. <laughs> I can talk yeah. about Free Baptists because they're my people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dalton. You've been awesome. But I do want to say, um, as we wrap up, I do. we just want to say thank you again for all the support and feedback. It really has been overwhelming. It has been just such a gift and surprise for us coming down here to our basement and James telling his story while I'm asking him questions. Just, I feel like you're so good at that. And I've enjoyed asking questions. It's what I like to do. And so, yeah. Does that wrap it up? Anything more? That wraps it up for me. We're looking forward to uh, season three. Free at last, free at last. (laughs) Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. Stay tuned. All right, we'll see you soon, guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. For more exclusive content, head over to our website, timjones.co slash podcast. Yes, you can subscribe by clicking on the Become a Patron button, and that's going to get you access to our For Real Reel, which is very different than the Highlight Reel. Reel. Some Some very juicy content there. Good stuff. Or you can look us up on Facebook and Instagram, Straight Out of Prison Podcast. Yes, that takes the story to a whole new level where you can see some of the people that James talks about in his story and see some of the places that he's been. I've been loving it, and you will too. Prison recipes. Yeah, all the things. (laughs) Good stuff. (laughs) We'll see you soon, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Getting anything out of these videos, please hit the like button, the subscribe. If you never want to miss a recipe or anything I do, hit the little bell and you'll get notifications.